The Apartment Gurus podcast is brought to you by Greenlight Equity Group, an apartment acquisitions and holdings firm co-founded by Carl York and Tate Seamer, host of this show. We offer you the opportunity to be an owner of cash-flowing, wealth-growing apartments without the headaches of being a landlord. These assets are recession-resistant, risk-mitigated, offer significant tax advantages, and are a great alternative to the stock market. Ready to check it out? Go to www.investwithgreenlight.com today to book a personal consultation with Carl or Tate. Again, that's investwithgreenlight.com. We look forward to meeting you. Welcome to The Apartment Gurus, where twice a week, host Tate Seymour brings you deep dive interviews with the wisest gurus in the apartment investing industry. These experts are sure to create game-changing value and inspiration designed to catapult your business to the next level. Be sure to reach out to Tate at www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. And now, here is Tate Seymour and the Apartment Gurus. Welcome, everybody, back to the Apartment Gurus podcast. And uh, super excited to, I'm, this is the last in my, what I'm calling the Sayulita series, where I'm actually, despite my background with the wintry Salt Lake uh, City scenery behind me, I'm actually uh, zooming in today from uh, Sayulita, Mexico, where I've been for the last uh, three plus weeks and working remotely down here and um, enjoying the surf and and the sun and the 80 degree weather while our mountains in Utah got seven feet of snow in the last uh, week or so. So uh, I, I missed all the skiing up there uh, with that. But my guest today is zooming in from a beautiful place as well, Bend, Oregon, uh, where I've, I've got I've been there one time and and was really blown away with the the beauty of that place and just a cool cultural scene and everything else. But uh, Mark Curie's on the show today. Mark, welcome. I'm super stoked to have you here. Thanks, Tate. Yeah, happy to be here with you. Yeah, you betcha. Uh, and, and Mark is the co-founder of SMK Capital Management, which is a boutique private equity real estate firm. Uh, he has 18 years of real estate investing experience and has been involved in both active and passive investments including residential and commercial real estate throughout the U.S. Uh, over the last decade, uh, Mark and uh, his affiliates of SMK have created and managed over 60 real estate partnerships with investors, investing in over 65 residential properties and 45 commercial real estate opportunities. Uh, 45 transactions. Am I, is that 45 different properties? Um, it could be funds too, Tate, right? Yeah. So when we say investment opportunities, sometimes there's funds, which might have a dozen sure. to two thousand yeah, yeah. So, Yeah, yeah. So, and then today, SMK and Mark uh, focus on recession resistant, uh, re recession resistance, which is so key right now. And uh, also raising private equity by partnering with sponsors across numerous asset classes, including, including mobile home parks, self-storage and multifamily. And those are really the three darlings of the commercial uh, real estate scene, especially in economic uh, distress and downturns. Uh, those three asset classes, multifamily, self-storage and mobile home parks historically perform quite well. And, uh, you know, we mentioned the word recession resistance in there. Uh, that that's key. And like listeners just right off the bat here, here's a takeaway for you. You should be talking about recession, recession resistance with your investors and with potential investors all the time right now, because it's so important to understand why would people invest in real estate right now? If it wasn't re recession, I can't say that very well. Can I, if it wasn't re recession resistant, <laughs> um, why would people invest in it? Because right now everything feels risky to investors. So to help them understand that concept, how when uh, when inflation goes up, rents go rents go up. So you've got a cash flowing asset that's paying its paying for itself and paying your investors and paying you uh, throughout an economic downturn. 
So um, understanding that I think is just really important. But anyway, Mark, again, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm really excited about uh, what we're going to have to talk about here today. And and um, if you would, uh, you know, just kind of give us a little more background and in, into your 18 years of experience, um, you know, maybe take us back to the beginning when you got in uh, into the real estate uh, space and what was your inspiration or or your catalyst for that? And and uh, how did that all go for you? Sure. I um, so I, I remember I was sitting in a, a cubicle. I worked in finance for Raytheon Company for a number of years doing budgets and planning, a little internal auditing. And uh, my cubicle mate sitting next to me um, said, hey, Mark, come over here, check this out. And so he, he pulled up a spreadsheet. We were always looking at spreadsheets tape, but this one wasn't for work. He was looking at a fourplex investment option in his uh, backyard and down the street from where he lived. And he had this pro forma that he showed me on how much money he was going to make on this uh, this fourplex that he wanted to buy. And that was, uh, you know, just uh, I looked at the numbers. I said, geez, what are we doing working here? We should just go buy a bunch of these things. Right. And so that was a kind of a first aha moment for me um, to, to kind of see the other side of how you can create you know, financial independence and wealth um, and do it over and over again. So that, that's a that's a good memorable moment for me to, to get me started. I've I, uh, been hooked ever since, Tate. That was in 2004. Bought my first property in 2005. It was a probate sale. Um, I had to go to the court mm-hmm. and I thought I already owned the place, but the judge, uh, you know, let a bunch of other people bid on it. And sure enough, there was three people that bid above my price. And I looked at my real estate agent and said, what's going on here? I thought we were here to get the deed. He said, I don't know. I guess there's other people that want to pay more. And so uh, what happened there, which is an interesting story too, they, the judge brought everybody over to the to his desk and he basically found out that their checks were made out incorrectly. And so their bids were void. And so I actually oh, wow. got to to buy the place. And I'm leaving the courthouse wondering like, what just happened here? Like such, such a clueless moment for me at the time in the process. And who's standing in the elevator next to me is the, the one guy that had the highest bid. And he just looks at me, he goes, Oh, you just got really lucky. And I said, oh. So these are just some of the things you remember early on about, uh, you know, falling in love, I guess, with real estate investing. Yeah. Yeah. So do you mind me? Uh, this will date you. I apologize. But do you mind me asking how old you were when you had that uh, when you saw that spreadsheet for the first time? I was 24. Yeah. So you you saw it young. You caught the vision young. Um, that's man. That's super exciting. Um, I, I sure wish I had had that inspiration, uh, you know, when I was that age, you know, and because you have your whole professional life ahead of you at that point, your wealth building years are pretty much right in front of you. And, and to to discover that vehicle then, um, you know, and of course we went through the, the crash of 07, 08, that timeframe. And, um, and so it wasn't all roses in real estate necessarily, especially in the single family space, uh, which was heavily, heavily hit by that crash, uh, that last crash, Take us, uh, take us to when commercial got on your radar and and uh, how you how you tackled that. Yeah, so from two thousand five to two thousand ten, uh, continued to buy property um, predominantly by partnering with my family members. My brother and I bought a fourplex. My parents and I and my other brother um, bought a couple prop distressed distressed properties in Florida where they were living. You know, bank owned stuff, take 50, 60 cents on the dollar from what they were selling for just two years prior. REOs, short sales, uh, you name it. Yeah. And um, I was still working full time until 2009. And at that point, um, just decided to open up our company uh, to be able to continue to buy more real estate um, with other partners and other investors. So SMK Capital Management was formed. That's my father and I's initials. Um, we went out and invited uh, everyone we knew over to our house and we gave them a PowerPoint presentation about a blind pool fund that we were going to raise wow. and on what we had just been doing as, as family members, right? And keep, continue to buy property. And at that time, you know, it was 2010, Tate. So investing in a blind pool fund with a, a new operator, probably not the, the safest thing to be doing, right? And so well, the reason also- why people invested... 
Well, sorry to interrupt you, Mark. It was also something that really wasn't like nearly as common then. And, you know, apartments syndication in general wasn't as well known at really at all compared to compared to now. And it's interesting to me that you started with that. Um, what was your I mean, that's pretty advanced, right? You know, raising for a fund, putting a fund together is a big deal. Uh, raising for a fund is a big deal. How did you decide to do that as opposed to just raising for each property individually? Well, we wanted diversification, Tate. That was always a big part of our uh, investment strategy and thesis is to have multiple properties into one entity so we could spread out risk without reducing return. And so we still focus very much on that today. Although we do do one-off investments, we also create funds as well. But back then it was really, you know, we were also buying $100,000 properties, Tate. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, $200,000 properties. Yeah. So to, to raise a small fund made more sense economically than having to go, you know, do a bunch of individual transactions. So that was a big part of it. The only reason why people invested with us at the time is just because they trusted us, right? They saw that we had created a, a team on the ground and that we had had some success and we wanted to keep going. And they liked us and knew us and trusted us. And that was yeah. that was the main reason of our, our uh, beginnings in, in SMK and, and getting uh, investors attracted to partnering with us back then. I mean, that had to have taken some courage and some uh, what's the word I'm like, I mean, just some some guts, right, to to approach your your network, your fr your friends and your family and and essentially bring them over to your house to pitch them on what you were up to. Um, did you was there any resistance around that for you or i'm sure that listeners are listening to this going yeah i don't know if I, i'd feel real comfortable doing that uh you know what was that like for you well i didn't feel comfortable no way yeah <laughs> i yeah. felt quite uncomfortable um but i also did it i presented um and i went through the powerpoint slides that we had created and i showed them what we wanted to do and just be completely transparent mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, no, it wasn't easy. It was hard. Um, but I just kind of ponied up and pushed through it because there was this kind of underlying passion, Tate, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're starting something great here and we want yeah. to have people join us. And that was really what, what fueled the, the courage to keep going, even though it was hard. Well, and it paid off apparently, right? I mean, either from that presentation or my guess would be word of mouth referrals. Oh, I know these folks that might want to, I, I don't want to do this, but I know three people that might want to do it kind of thing. It's like the bigger splash you make or are willing to make, the more attention you get and the better results you get. Uh, so, you know, what a great way to kick, What I mean, no better way to kick it off really that I, that I can think of. Yeah. Yeah. We dove in to say the least. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. Um, well, so take us, to today so uh to, you talk about smk and as far as your portfolio uh what you're focused on now um you know it, it, all that stuff like sure. what's your team look like that sort of thing yeah yeah so you know kind of just piggybacking off of where we left off started our company at that time tate we were uh, essentially an operating partner and a sponsor we would source underwrite acquire, manage everything from A to Z on all of our investments, including our investor capital, uh, the debt, you know, picking paint colors, you, you name it. And uh, we did that till about 2017, 2018. But along the way in like 2011, 2012, uh, we started, we had been investing personally as limited partners in mm -hmm. other syndications, right? And the purpose for that was, well, I had left corporate America I had retirement funds sitting idle. You can't invest them in your own deal. And so I went on a two-year networking binge and met some savvy folks in asset classes that had done well through the recession, uh, mobile home parks, self-storage, apartments, to name a few, and started investing with them. You know, personally, uh, as an LP, Tate, my, myself, some family members did that. After a few years of doing both, we started seeing kind of the, the risk reward profile, the returns, and looking forward at what was most scalable when the markets change, uh, you know, deeply discounted properties were becoming harder and harder to find, and the competition was increasing significantly. And so we started pivoting towards more 
uh, syndications and creating investments where our investors could also invest in mobile home parks and self storage and a few other asset classes where we were relying on operating partners that we had personally invested with and had a good experience with to execute on the business plan. And so fast forward today, you know, that's where that's all we do now, Tate. We work with operating partners in each one of our preferred asset classes. We have relationships with them when they get deals through their acquisitions team. They'll send me an email or call, hey, Mark, we got a live one. Are you guys interested in participating? They'll send over the deal, the underwriting. We'll see if it makes sense for us. Um, today, we're looking at 10 to 20 deals a month, Tate. We invest, uh, we've done six investments all year. And so we're almost near the end of the year. And so it's filtration process. We know what we like. We know what we're looking for. We know who we want to work with. We know who we don't want to work with. Uh, that process of you know the last 12, 13 years of that just has created a, a, a kind of a repetitive system internally where we, we, maybe it's a little bit boring, but I like that. I think that's the way to do things today where you, uh, aren't trying to do something new and fancy and shiny every every six months or so. We're we're sticking to what we know works well, and uh, we continue to do that. Yeah. I'm sure what you're looking for now has shifted and changed based on the market shifts and changes. But up, let's say up until the beginning of this year, what were you looking for? You said you know what you're looking for. You know what you're not looking for. You know who you want to work with, and you know who you don't want to work with. Um, describe that a little bit what your criteria looks like. Yeah. So as far as people go and operating partners and other um, companies that we partner with Tate, um, you know, it's, it's a never ending process of determining who to, to work with. Uh, the reason why is because there's uh, people change, their companies change, their growth trajectory changes, their acquisition criteria changes mm -hmm. based on market conditions, based on, um, you know, the trajectory of their company, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so you're always uh, analyzing the people side from the beginning of the introduction of the relationship to making the first investment, to analyzing the performance, you know, quarter, year after year, to the exit, et cetera, et cetera. There's always that never ending analysis of the people. We've uh, underwritten and vetted uh, over 120 operating partners over the years. Uh, I tell people, you know, we, we have a yes, a maybe, and a no bucket. The yes bucket has the fewest number of people and groups in it that we'll work with. Uh, the maybe, maybe bucket is, is approaching around 70 groups and you know, about 30, 40, 50 groups in the no bucket. And so that's kind of how we're, we're looking at it from 30,000 feet looking down. Uh, what, what gets groups into the yes bucket? It's a few things. Usually it's experience. We want uh, to partner with groups that are, you know, best in class. I know it sounds cliche, but literally best in class. And so you look at assets under management uh, for a multifamily operator. It's usually 500 million plus, a lot of them are a billion plus. Um, you want to ideally have folks that have been through multiple cycles. You want to find folks that are uh, better and smarter than you, right, Tate? Let's just be honest that yeah. you would want to partner with instead of compete against and that kind of concept. And how do they underwrite? How do they think? Are they conservative? Do they use debt wisely? Are they you know, just trying to grow for the sake of growth? You know, this kind of thing. And so that's, those are some of the uh, points that we look at when it comes to people. You know, pet pedigree at the end of the day is really the main focus. Sure. Um, and then as far as investments go, you know, how do we know if a deal is going to work for us or not? We um, we have a little bit of a line in the sand today. I'll, I'll share kind of a story about our evolution and how we've pivoted over the last, call it five years or so with market conditions. So I mentioned to you before, we used to focus predominantly on single family, small multifamily, a lot of distressed assets. And we started investing a little bit over 10, 11 years ago into more commercial real estate by 2018, we thought there could be a recession coming soon, Tate. There was a good number of indicators in the marketplace that might have reached peak, and there could be a correction soon. Yep. So we wanted to invest in or create a vehicle that we could allow our investors and us to invest in to weather a storm, something that would uh, not uh, we wouldn't be forced to sell at the wrong time. Yeah. We could essentially hold and wait and continue to cash flow and right. retain asset value. And so we created a fund, recession resistant fund is the name of it, 
We invested in mobile home parks, uh, self-storage facilities, and um, Class B workforce housing, predominantly in growth markets, mm -hmm. uh, over the period of about a year. We closed that fund in uh, late 2019. Um, we ended up investing in a little over 50 properties across 13 states. Mm -hmm. uh, to date, it's done uh, quite well. We've returned over a third of our investors' principal through some refinancing and some property sales. Mm -hmm. And we've uh, just about caught up the preferred return of 8 to 10% annually for each one of our investors. And so the reason I mentioned this too is because we were predominantly looking at five to 10 year holds, right? We weren't looking for shorter term deals, Tate. Yeah. Again, to not sell at the wrong time. Right. And then 2020 happened. We, uh, you know, COVID onset in Q1 ish, we stopped investing entirely for six, seven, eight months, something like that, into anything new. We just waited, watched, analyzed the markets, our own portfolios, uh, trying to figure out what, what was going to happen, right? We'd never seen a series of these events before, um, basically telling everyone to stay home and stop working. And then, injecting uh, capital into people's bank accounts, businesses, et cetera. So a whole new level of um, action had been taking place that we'd never seen before. And so we, we paused on new investments. Um, and what we found by the end of summer in 2020 was that there wasn't going to be distress. Tenants were, for the most part, staying and paying. Occupancies were remaining high. Yeah. Um, Collections were remaining high, receivables, and we uh, decided at that time we started seeing really rapid rent growth. We started seeing demand for affordable housing, but also, you know, nicer stuff. Tate, let's just call it value add, where we could come in and improve the property. There was a lot of uh, residents looking for that, and there was also equity groups who we sell to. Right, that's our exit strategy. We're, we're heavily looking for that, so we saw cap rate compression. And uh, short-term tailwinds, we call it. So we decided to start investing in shorter-term deals, two to three-year holds predominantly, apartments in growth markets with a, uh, a reputable operating partner, you know, $5 billion of assets under management today. Wow. And so we did that for a period of time. And then fast forward to Q1 of 2023. Excuse me, 2022. We're not in 2023 yet. We're almost there. But in Q1 of 2022, we we paused again. We pivoted back to more recession resistance, medium to long term holds, five to ten years. Tate really focusing on you know fixed rate debt, long term envision to again be able to weather a potential storm. So that's a bit about our mm -hmm. our evolution, how we've pivoted with the market, and kind of what we're we're doing today. Those properties that you went for that period of time that you went short, shorter term models, are they in okay shape um, as far as, you know, what we're going into now and, you know, that those models, are they going to stand through through this, do you think? I mean, we, we had one that exited already. Um, okay. It sold in uh, 13 months. We had projected, a, I think, wow. a three-year hold. It was just an absolute home run. We got a 92% IRR to our investors. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, you know, that, that was great. Uh, we still hold a handful. Um, valuations are strong, Tate, but obviously mm -hmm. cash flow has been impacted, right? And yeah. so we weren't really going into these deals for the cash flow. We were going right. to them for the value add growth. And so while we, we, we love cash flow, it's one of our favorite um, aspects of investments, especially today. These deals were not uh, targeted for that. They're targeted for growth. So today, with interest rates rising, all of the properties that we um, are talking about Tate, have interest rate caps on them that have been met. And so at this point, the interest rates are fixed um, and we're continuing to add value, continue to grow NOI. And we'll see where things go. You know, we don't know, but we still see um, a pretty strong runway going forward as far as you know, you keep growing NOI and you're going to find yourself in a pretty good situation. And so yeah, yeah. we're in uh, growth markets on these deals and, uh, you know, Phoenix, parts of Texas, so Las Vegas, we're just seeing that the uh, uh, rent bumps uh, from pre-renovated units to post-renovated units uh, continue to perform at or better than projections. So we're continuing to renovate. We're seeing uh, a lot of demand for the uh, end, end user on those units. 
Yeah. It seems to me like right now, the heavy value ads are kind of where it's at, where you can essentially guarantee yourself the, the rent premiums, even if you're conservative. And, uh, and and then, you know, obviously, therefore, guaranteeing the forced depreciation uh, because your NOI is going up. That to me is like, you know, the rent growth play doesn't exist right now. In fact, you know, I had uh, Jeremy Roll on the show uh, last week or the week before, and he was talking, you need to be underwriting at least flat rent growth, if not negative rent growth. Uh, and at least in some markets right now, probably most markets right now, you need to, if you're going to be conservative in your underwriting, you need to be able to account for that. Um, do you agree with me on as far as the value add thing goes, uh, where that's almost a necessary, I mean, like the heavier, the better right now? Yeah, to some degree, I would agree, uh, Tate. And I'll share with you some thoughts on it. You know, Heavier value add comes with higher risk. Uh, there's higher risk of not being able to execute. There's higher risk yeah. of vacancy being higher than you expected. There's yeah. higher risk of a lot of things, right? You have to do a lot of work to be able to create the value. Now, we've been value add investors for over a decade. And so we've seen light lifts. We've seen very heavy lifts. Uh, there's pros and cons to both, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll add this, that... Um, I would agree with underwriting, you know, flat to no rent growth organically, of course. But if you have a value add business plan, you're almost uh, almost certain. I shouldn't say oh, yeah. certain to be able to have rent growth. So, yeah. otherwise, why would you do it, right? Like you're right. not going to take a 1980s vintage apartment community that hasn't been renovated in 25 years and then go spend you know ten thousand dollars renovating the interior of a unit to get the same rent. Right, you wouldn't do that, right? Usually, there's a pretty significant gap between uh, existing and post renovation rent. It doesn't make sense to come in and do this. And how can we ensure that we're going to you know, benefit by growing the net operating income? So th those are the, some of the things that we look at. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that's helpful, but that's how we analyze it. We do like value add deals. If it's too heavy of a value add, there'll be no cash flow for a year or two until the the uh, property is stabilized. Yeah. Then it becomes a little bit more like a redevelopment play. So it comes with higher risk. And so you're going to want to be rewarded with a higher return for taking that additional risk. Yeah. So there's a bit of a balancing act there. Yeah. I'm I'm asking you this selfishly because we're under LOI on a very heavy value lift uh in Oklahoma. Oh, cool. and, um and it works specifically because it's a very heavy value lift and there's this huge opportunity. And but like you say. Uh, we call it construction risk, um, where you introduce a complex business plan with a very intense remodel and renovation. Um, you introduce the risk of uh, unreliable or dishonest labor um, or just incompetent labor um, and material costs, you know, potentially spiking. Like you said, uh, maybe lease ups or turnovers don't go as well. Now, our place is 90 percent vacant, um, so it's going to almost be easier as a result with the construction plan. But we're going to have that, you know, that entire community to lease up. So we're having to take into account demand in the in the market um and that sort of thing as, as we underwrite this and we're we're really just entering due diligence on it um but we're very excited about it the price per unit is extremely low uh because of the distress the property's in so you know we're going to be in these property for less than uh, fifty thousand a unit and they should the unit should rent for eight to nine hundred dollars so um in a in a military town right like that would, which which was a concern for us. Uh, we really prefer growth markets with a lot of uh, employment diversification, uh, and this is not this is not that. This is a kind of a one horse town with an a very large, uh, very established army base. We feel very strongly that the base is going to be there and and uh, continue to provide the economy that we need. Um, based on the research we've done there. So for you, Mark, what, uh, 
like what's a home run in this market right now? Like what uh, what are you really looking for? Like what really gets you excited when you see it come across your desk? Yeah. So, um, what's a home run? I mean, we're not trying to hit home runs right now. We're trying. Yeah, to that's that's a good point. That's a really yeah. good point. Uh, you know, maybe this isn't a time to be swinging for the fences at all. Uh, maybe this is a time not, not to for us. get yeah. them on base and get them over. Right. I mean, we're looking for, I'll tell you what, what our investment criteria is today, Tate. Um, we want to be able to see that the asset can uh, very reasonably provide cash flow in year one, call it 5% plus. Mm -hmm. We want to see long-term fixed rate debt for most of these deals. Yeah. 65% LTV is great. Um, and we want to have a business plan where we can grow NOI, uh, whether that be through taking advantage of mismanagement or human error that the previous seller and owner uh, was or wasn't doing at the property, um, uh, or or just a lot of times it's rents haven't been raised in you know many years. Uh, sellers have been managing to occupancy not to NOI growth. And so there's a lot of different levers we'll look for in the business plan to come in and, and grow the valuation. Um, I'll tell you about the last deal we did. I think that to me would be, I mean, I would do it again in a heartbeat if there was another one like it. So maybe that's probably worth sharing, but um, it was a uh, tax exempt multifamily property in Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, property taxes were exempt. Um, and, and how is that? What is that? And basically what it is, it's a, a public-private partnership uh, where we are able to allocate up to half of the units for an affordable component. And so it's affordable housing that we're creating for local community. It's tied to area median income. And so we keep about 50% of the units um, affordable. And the other 50 are at market. In exchange, uh, you get a uh, tax abatement. You also get very attractive debt terms, seven years of interest only, 10 years fixed, 4.94%, mm. 65%. Wow. No, I'm sorry, 76% loan to cost. Wow. Um, cash flow year one, you know, wouldn't be there if it wasn't for the tax exemption. And so you have a, a, a situation where, and this property, Tate, just to put it in perspective, was a, 2015 build in uh, right near downtown Houston. And so you have a 99% occupied property. Seller hadn't raised rents in quite some time. They've been managing to occupancy, same story there. Um, but by putting in this uh, tax exemption structure while in escrow, because the seller didn't have it in place, it goes into effect right when we buy the property. And so, you know, day one, we were saving significantly on property taxes each year yeah. going forward. So that's a unique strategy for us to see. We've done a few of these now where uh, I think they're one of the best strategies today to take advantage of um, all the opportunities that we see out there that maybe don't uh, have as much, I should say, upside, but they're, they're just what we're doing with this type of investment is reducing risk and still getting a very attractive return. Who's the lender in that scenario? That can do that one was uh, it's agency financing, so wow. it's uh, they have an affordable product specific okay. to these kinds of deals where you get more favorable debt terms. Got it. Fascinating. That is a great concept. Okay, so how do you go out and find those? I mean, like you said, you take another <laughs> one in a heartbeat. How, how do you find those? I mean, is it just, just kind of they're just there when they're there kind of thing, or is there a way to prospect yeah. for those? So for us, again, it's all about relationships, Tate. So yeah. we um, we work with an operating partner specific to this type of strategy. They've been in the affordable uh, low-income housing space for over a decade. They used to do a lot of light tech deals. Yeah. They recently shifted over in the last couple of years to these types of affordable deals uh, where we're not necessarily getting uh, you know, subsidized. It's more just the tenant qualification goes down. They can make less money. They still have to qualify, right? Yeah. But they can earn less uh, and still be able to live there and afford the rent because we're keeping half the units uh, rent restricted. So the, the rents either go down or they stay stay pretty flat. Yeah, got it. So um, that deal came to us just the relationship tape that we have. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
Awesome stuff. Uh, where are you guys headed with? Uh, well, I actually have a couple other questions. When you, your recession resistance fund, what, if you don't mind me asking, what was the size of that fund? Um, as far as number of units or, or a ton yeah, of- number of units, uh, assets under management, et cetera. Yeah. We raised around 2.5 million for that fund from our equity group. Um, we invested, I think, in nine different deals, Tate. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that included some single assets and some funds across mobile homes, self-storage, and apartments. So at the end, we were diversified across 50 plus properties. Wow. I think it was over 12,000 units. The so, valuation of those properties was probably near half a billion. Wow. Okay. Got it. And you're investing 50, 100, 200,000 at a time in each property as strictly as an LP, or are you coming in as you know, a, a, a large LP or the LP? We do both. Depends on the deal, Tate. So the, the Houston deal I just told you, we were a large LP. Uh, we got better terms because of our relationship and be, because we're managing our own investors internally. Um, and so uh, we got a higher PREF, we got a higher split above the PREF, and we also got consent rights. Um, so we have a little bit more control of the assets and the operations going forward, should that be needed. Um, but for a fund like the recession resistant fund, you know, there was a few operating partners where we also got preferential treatment, higher PREF, higher split that all flows through to the fund, to our investors. Um, we look at it both ways. It's really more just the, how can I say it? The, we're always trying to reduce risk and not sacrifice on a term. Mm-hmm. And so if we can do that by creating a fund. Um, and we can get preferential treatment on some of the terms from our operating partners. Um, you know, that to me is a win-win. If we don't get it on all of them, is that going to say, you know, stop us from doing something? No, we'll just look at the net return to our investors. It's still very attractive for the amount of uh, investments that we're going to make and manage in this fund and obviously reduce risk by diversifying and spreading capital out. So that's how we look at it today. I mean, we're still we're we're going to create a new fund shortly. Tate, um, we get preferential terms from most of our operating partners, and uh, we might invest you know five hundred k on the smaller side, up to five million into a deal. Just depends on uh, the timing and the ebb and the flow of the capital, the deals. Got it. Got it. How do, uh, in this scenario, how do, how does your company get compensated for all the work you do and? and what you put together or do you get gp uh percentage on some of these or how does that work sometimes yeah but uh it just depends on on the structure with our operating partners right Mm -hmm. so uh we'll always create a entity that our investors will fund into which is managed by us smk capital management and then we provide our operating partners you know one contact which is us and one check and then we manage all of our investors the relationship with them quarterly updates, distributions, you know, calls, emails, questions, et cetera. Um, we allow them to, to spread their capital across a bunch of different types of deals. And so the fee structure for us is uh, it's pretty straightforward. We typically have a, a 1% annual asset management fee on, mm-hmm. on equity invested. We might have a, a, a 1% or 1.5% um, acquisition fee yep. for doing the deal. And then... Um, We'll have a preferred return to our investors. That's typically between seven and ten percent annually. Mm-hmm. And then, really, what we're in it for is the split above that, which is mm-hmm. usually uh, seventy to eighty percent for our investors and twenty to thirty percent for for us as the manager. Yeah, yeah. So it's basically it's set up like a syndication. Uh, just happens to be many properties instead of one. You're just paying a pref. There's an equity split the whole nine yards, even the acquisition fee and the asset management fee are there. So uh, yeah, totally easy to understand. Okay. So, you know, big crystal ball question here. Um, What are you expecting to see over the next, you know, let's say six to 18 months and, and how are you guys preparing for that? What do you, you know, has this changed your trajectory as far as your goal setting, stuff like that? Like what, how are you looking forward at this point? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're constantly analyzing those questions, Tate, daily, uh, internally. Yeah. And, and um, you know, we, we 
the headwinds that we've faced in 2022 thus far have been a few, not a lot. They've mm. been predominantly inflation and the Fed's battle against it by raising interest rates very quickly. So we're tracking that very closely. Uh, where we sit today, we're nearing the end of November, and the Fed uh, just recently hinted that they may slow down the rate of uh, increasing on in interest rates as early as the December 14th meeting. That's the day after the next CPI inflation data numbers come out on the 13th. And so it'll all be uh, uh, quite interesting to see how it transpires. But we also just saw in the last two weeks or so, Tate, that inflation growth is uh, slowed to its slowest rate since January of this year. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned these data points that we track because they are indicating that there's perhaps we're at a peak of inflation. Right. Perhaps it will start to go down. And if so, perhaps the Fed will slow its interest rate growth trajectory. This is something we've been waiting for for several quarters now to try and get some visibility as to where and how quickly uh, inflation and interest rates are going to go. And so the question is, you know, is there going to be a soft landing? Will the Fed continue to rate a hike at 75 basis points right. for the next few meetings? Uh, we don't know. Obviously, we're, we're thinking that maybe some of these early indicators that I mentioned are in our favor. Um, I think what the what the investment market needs to see is some type of stability where we can underwrite properly, knowing, hey, we're going to, if you're under LOI on this deal, Tate, what's your borrowing rate? Do you have any idea? You have a general idea, but it yeah. could go up. Right, right. <laughs> and, and by the time you go to lock that rate in, and so you're going to pad numbers pretty heavily, I think, yeah. in order to feel confident about that acquisition. And so what that does is you have this disconnect that's been going on and quite exacerbated today between buyers and sellers. Yeah. Sellers, you know, generally speaking, the fundamentals of these assets are relatively strong. You still have high occupancy, still have rent growth, uh, although not nearly as high as last year. You still have rent growth. Uh, Collections are good at this point. Collections are good. Demand is yep. high. People are looking for affordable housing uh, because they can't afford to buy a house. Yeah. So as a seller, you're sitting there saying, gosh, I, things aren't so bad here. Why would I sell it for what I think is a lowball offer? I'll just wait. And so that's what's happening for a lot of these transactions. The sellers are just sitting on the sidelines, yeah. waiting to see what's going to happen while buyers are largely lowballing, which I understand, of course. We're not uh, saying that's good or bad. It's just the reality of the market today. So I think if we see some stability, call it in the next three to six months on inflation and interest rates, hopefully that disconnect between buyer and seller reduces a bit, Tate, and we'll see a little bit better, um, you know, I would say synergy between both parties to be able to transact more because transactions have just kind of stalled. Yeah, Sellers don't want to sell for what buyers want to pay. And so we don't know. We'll see where it goes. We're, we're opportunistic. I think there's going to be some forced sales in the next... Yeah. All at three, six, 12, 18 months. Um, we'll, we got we got our eyes and ears open. If those opportunities come to fruition, um, we'll, we'll be on them. But uh, we're not there yet. We'll see what comes. Yeah, it will be extremely interesting to see how these opportunities with you know distressed situations and mismanagement and under management and that sort of thing, how that all develops over the next year or so and what people like you and I are going to see coming across our desk in the way of opportunities um, that we can provide our investors. I, I think it's going to be a very, very interesting time um, for sure. So, uh, but you're right. We're in this kind of twilight zone of like sellers expectations just haven't changed with the interest rate hike, the way that we as investors need them to before we can make deals pencil again. Um, we're seeing that left and right in our world. So, you know, you see syndicators getting out of the business, like, you know, in 08, in that 07, 08 crash, I think like 75, 80% of realtors got out of the business or, you know, gave up their license or whatever it was. Do you see that happening with investors in this market? Yeah, it's a good question. I haven't seen it yet, Tate. We'll see where it goes. Um, you know, raising capital has become harder for most groups today yeah. because of 
all the fear and uncertainty and volatility in the marketplace, right? And so uh, for a newer, younger syndicator, it might be harder to raise money uh, going yeah. forward if it isn't already. Does that mean they go out of business? Possibly. I, I haven't seen it yet. Um, as far as an operating partner goes, we haven't seen that yet either. I think mm -hmm. it's uh, there's so much wait and see going on right now, Tate. So yeah. we'll see where it goes. But uh, I hope that doesn't all happen. I, I hope there's a soft landing. And I hope that people can continue on and, and continue to, to create and grow businesses and invest wisely. Um, I think we'll if we talk again in 12 months, let's see what, where things are, right? Yeah. Well, let's do that, Mark. Let's make a point of circling back up in a year and and reviewing and kind of looking at what SMK has been able to pull off and and, uh, you know, what the differences are in the market and differences are in strategy and all that stuff. So, um, well, listeners, I want you to get uh, on to the interwebs and uh, and find uh, find Mark. Uh, Mark's last name is Curie, K-H-U-R-I, and his website is S as in Sam, M as in Mary, K, CAP, so smkcap.com, and uh, Mark has a great guide for passive investors, kind of the five things to take into consideration when, as a passive investor, to reduce risk. Um, and so th that's a, an ebook that um, you can get at smkcap.com forward slash five steps. And uh, definitely check that out and, and check out uh, Mark's website. And, you know, sign I'm sure you guys have an investor list, something they can uh, sign up for there, Mark. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're a passive investor listening and you want to learn more about what we do as investments that we uh, create for our investor group, you know, head over to our website. You can uh, sign up there. I, I do personally speak with every one uh, Tate of our investors or prospects just to have a conversation, see what they're all about, what they're doing, learn more about their goals. Um, what are they looking for? Income, growth, both, you know, this kind of thing, what kind of risk tolerance levels they have to see if we're a good fit and then, uh, and then share offerings with them. So yeah, uh, that's kind of our process internally. We, um, we, we tend to take a little bit more of a white glove approach with our investor group. Uh, it's not a very large investor group. Uh, everyone has my cell phone number and email. So we try and listen and also answer questions um, all the time that people have and that come up so that they understand what we're doing and why, and obviously uh, feel comfortable with their investments. Perfect. Well, Mark, uh, this has been awesome. I, I'm going to put you on the spot here and ask you kind of, you know, for for the listener here, the the aspiring aspiring investor uh, or the active investor that's that's leveling up, uh, what what kind of words of wisdom do you have uh, about this business and what it takes to be successful? Yeah, um, you know, I think today top of mind is be patient. Mm. That's cliche, but like really, you got to be patient. Yeah, and if you think something's going to get done in a couple months expect it to take twice as long, whatever that yeah. thing is. Um, yeah. And then surround yourself with people that are, are better at your craft than you are. And uh, until you have those folks around you, don't stop searching for them. I, I went on a two year networking hiatus. I was at investor group meetups for every week for almost two years, Tate, just meeting people. Yeah. And so that, that, that's where I met some of the you know, smartest people that we still work with today. And so that's part of it for us is just uh, people and patience. Yeah, that's great. Really well said. Uh, and I, I will be seeing each other at the best ever conference in uh, Salt Lake City coming up this winter. Uh, we were talking offline that we're, we'll both be attending that and, and hopefully even get a little skiing in, uh, you know, just before, just after the conference. So uh, I'm looking forward to staying in touch and and uh, and getting our heads together in person, Mark. Yeah, likewise, Tate. Let's do that. It's a couple months away, and I'm, I'm excited for you to show me Snowbird. So <laughs> I'd love to, love to. I, I love being tour guide because I'm not from there. You know, it's all wondrous to me still, even after 23 oh, years of being cool. there. And um, and so I love 
showing people around um, the the mountains. It's it's a thrill. Uh, so, Mark, again, thank you so much for being on the show, sharing your experience, your wisdom, your your intelligence, and and your resources on your website. Everything that you brought to the show, really appreciate you. My pleasure, Tate. Thank you. Yeah. You're you're welcome. And listeners, thank you. Uh, you are why we do this and why we do what we do and why I love it so much. I love being able to be a, a contribution, how ever significant it is to you. And uh, I'll just remind you that you guys, if you're listening to these episodes and you're listening to the end and hearing this right now, um, you're engaging and, and you are doing uh, very important things inside of your business, uh, working on your business this way. It's not everything. Action steps are huge. Like you just can't, you can't listen to podcasts and be successful. You got to listen to podcasts, go out and take big action. And like Mark said, people, networking, those relationships, the national conferences, the meetup groups, the masterminds, the, that's where the rubber meets the road in this business. It's all about relationships. So, so uh, again, listeners, thank you for, for listening to another episode of the Apartment Gurus. And we will catch you on the next one. Take care, everybody. This has been The Apartment Gurus with Tate Seymour. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast platform. To contact Tate, go to www.investwithgreenlight.com for access to his investor portal and Calendly link. He loves to hear from you and thanks you for being a valued listener. Just a reminder that you are the guru. See you on the next episode of The Apartment Gurus.